Hey everyone, this is Matt Perez, and today I want to kick off a small series looking at SOLIDWORKS animation. Now animation is something that we've covered in several other videos and other series. We've talked about animation in our motorcycle series where we looked more at motion study type animation where we did kinematics and we had added forces and things like that. We've looked at event-based motion when we did our pick and place machine, the MLC robot, that's going through a full stage of designing the part, doing the animation, and actually going in and doing some other things with that machining and, and master cam and so on. So we've already looked at how to do animation in a basic sense for a few different topics. And what I want to cover in this two video series is actually animating the removal of material. Now this is something that it's not that hard to do, but if you haven't seen it before, or if you haven't figured it out before, it can be a little cumbersome, a little troublesome to try to figure out how you can actually do it. So there are a couple different ways that we can do it, and I'm going to show you two different ways, and then we're going to talk about the benefits of each. I have two examples, that's why we're going to probably do two videos, is because both examples are going to take their own amount of time. The first one is going to be some sort of rotating bit. If you can actually think of this more like a lathe part, it's actually in reverse because I'm rotating the tool and I'm keeping the stock stationary. But what we're going to do is we're going to have this tool rotate and as we move the stock down it we want to remove material. The other example is a more traditional example of a mill bit and a plate where we're going to run that mill bit through the plate and we want to remove the material from that. So as you can see, we've got some challenges ahead of us. We've got two distinct examples, and they actually use the same technique, but it's a little bit different to set up. Both of these have already been through a little bit of setup. I created a layout sketch for uh, my machined rod example here, and that layout sketch just gave me a position to help locate these parts. If we show the layout, you can see it's just two circles, and the circles overlap, and it's giving me the diameter of my tool, and it's also giving me the diameter of my stock. So those are used to help locate these in space uh, because they are free for certain dimensions. This one can actually rotate and move back and forth. And if we look at the mates, there's some coincident mates, concentric mates, and then there's these mates that are layout on plane. And these were actually used when I created these parts. Uh, I actually used them and brought those into my parts and my sketches, and that way I kept all those dimensions the same. The reason I like to do that with a layout sketch is because now I can go back, I can modify the layout, and then my parts will update accordingly. So it simplifies things a little bit if you're thinking you might update the parts. The limit distance mate I threw in here just to limit the distance of our stock so it's a little bit ahead of the blade and then it goes all the way to the end of the blade. You can control this a few different ways and I decided to do it this way because in our animation we're just going to go from one key point time to another and we can simply manually drag it from one side to the other rather than controlling the dimensions in that value. The other example, the machine plate, we have a mill bit that's going to travel along this path here. When we get to this example I'll explain some of the headaches involved with this and we'll talk about what will work and what won't work because there, uh, there are some limitations to this, to both of these really, because it's not really ideal. You're just kind of using this sometimes to show off certain examples or there might be other times that you might need to use this. A good example of when this would actually be used would be doing some sort of animated cutaway. If you have a housing and you want to do an animation and a render together, you can animate this kind of cutaway procedure and cut away from part of your housing and show other things. And it's kind of a handy tool that's been used for years and years in SolidWorks when that kind of functionality wasn't available in 3D via Composer, SolidWorks Composer, and, and so on as it's progressed through the years. So let's get started with this example. Now that we've talked about all the basics, how would we remove the material from this rod? Now, the first way that you might think to do this is to actually go back into this part, edit it, and create an extrude cut that is based on the geometry of this tool. Now that is definitely a way that you can do it, and the problems that are associated with that method come up when you have a gap between these two. So if you do an extrude cut that goes from this face to, to this face, basically on the part, when your part is overlapping, everything's fine. It's going to cut away the material just as you want. If the part is offset here, it's going to throw up an error in your feature tree. And the reason the error is bad is because when you're doing an animation, when these errors pop up, it's going to halt things. You have to go in, rebuild it, fix it, come back out. So 
if the first quarter of a second, half a second is motion where this guy isn't touching, and if you're doing, let's say you're doing 10 frames per second, you know, half a second, you've got five frames where you need to go in and fix that every time and then come back and, and have it run. And there are other ways that you can get around that too, but that's one way that you can do it. And one way that most people jump to right away is to do some sort of feature in that part and use that. Another way, because we're in an assembly, is we actually have assembly features. So if you go to insert assembly feature, you can do an extrude cut within here. It's the same process with the exception that the extrude cut feature is within your assembly rather than the part. It still has the same drawback. It still has the same limitation that when you're doing an extrude and you're trying to cut material away, if there is an overlap here from your reference, you know, your two from distances, if there's an overlap here or if there's a gap here, then it's going to throw up an error in that feature and it's not going to work. So again, you're going to have to rebuild it, fix it, make sure that you kind of nurse it along for the first little bit of your animation. The way that I like to do this is actually a little bit more involved in terms of the amount of work that you have to do. We're going to create a basically a dummy part and we're going to use that dummy part within our original part. So to get started, I'm going to go to my insert components and insert a new part. For this new part, I'm simply going to hit the escape key and that's going to allow me to insert the part at the origin of the assembly. So my front plane for the assembly is the front plane for my new part. And I do this in most cases so I don't create any unwanted references. I don't create some sort of on-plane reference with a part, especially in this case since they're going to be moving, it's really going to mess up the procedure. Now that we have that in place, we're going to go ahead and show my layout sketch again. And the layout sketch gives us a good sketch here that we can use. So in my new part, if we want to go ahead and edit this part, we can see that my front plane is on the back side of the blade that we're using, the tool that we're using. So in here, I'm simply going to create a tool that we can use to do an extrude cut. So I'm going to center it at the layout sketch position. So if we go to my sketch tab, I'm going to draw two circles on the front plane of my new part. So we've got a circle that is starting here and then we've got one that's a little bit larger. Now what we're doing here is we're creating an extrude cut that's only going to remove a small amount of material. Now if we look at this thing in a normal two state, you can see that our two circles, this outside one, it doesn't really matter how big it is because we just need to remove that material. So I can make it inch and a quarter big and it's not really going to affect anything because we're not cutting away from our tool. The inside one, however, we want to make sure that we have some sort of tangency with our cutter bit or we can simply use a dimension. Now in this case, if I say 0.75, you can see that it's a little bit undersized. If instead I create a tangency with this part here, then it's going to update whenever I update that layout sketch. That information is there and it can be used simply by adding that relation. So if we escape, all we want to do now is create a solid extrude. Now the reason we want to do a solid extrude is because we're going to be using this geometry in another example or another part of this example. So we can either enter a value for the thickness of our blade, in this case it's a quarter inch thick, or we can use references, we can say, you know, up to this face if we want to, that way it updates later for us. The important thing that we need to do here is add a direction to. Now the reason we need to add a direction to is because as we slide this rod down, we want to make sure that we're not just cutting away a small amount of material and it's popping back up on this side. So you want to make sure that's long enough for the entire part, the entire stock that you're moving. In this case, I'm going to enter five inches and that's going to take care of this for us. So now that we have this solid body here, what can we do with it? We need to hop back out of this part. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hide my layout again and I'm going to hop into this machined rod part. So we're going to edit this part and inside here, the first thing that you might try to do is use the combined and try to subtract this from this. Well, it's not going to work because this is in another part. You can see that it's actually grayed out. The next thing you might want to do is a move copy and you might try to do a copy of this, but again, we're in an assembly. These items cannot be brought into a part because they're in separate part files. The trick to get around this is to use an offset surface with a zero value. Now it's a couple extra steps, but it does work and it's very robust. So I'm just going to grab all the faces that make up this part. So I have all four faces. I'm going to say, okay. Now you'll notice in my feature tree, 
that if we expand this, we have a solid bodies and a surface bodies folder. So we have the original extrude, our stock, and we have the boss extrude, the original feature, and then we have that surface offset. We want to now take that surface offset and use thicken and create a closed volume. Because it is enclosed, we can create a solid from that. We want to deselect and merge results. So now we've created a solid within this part file. Let's go ahead and hop back out of here. We want to rebuild everything and we're going to hide that machine rod solid extrude that we created. It's just a reference. We don't need to see it anymore, but we need to leave it in the assembly. So let's take a look at what happens here. If we move this rod, you can see that the whole thing is moving, but when it's rebuilt, this piece snaps back into place. And the reason it does that is because it's referenced off of this part that we drew. Even though as we move this manually, it's actually moving the entire part, it's going to pop back every time it rebuilds. So when you're inside your animation, every frame is going to get built and then rendered out. So if we hop back into this part one more time, now I'm doing a couple extra steps here just to make sure that we understand the process, but you don't necessarily have to hop back out and in and out of these parts if you don't want to. The last thing that we need to do here is use the combine feature. And we're going to subtract the main body is going to be the stock and the bodies to combine is going to be that surface knit that that extrude that we copied and we use that surface copy and brought into our part. So now if we hop back out of here, you'll see that it's removed the material. If we drag this part down, rebuild it, you can see that as it gets dragged down, it's cutting that material away and it's rebuilding and everything's working fine. And the important bit here is if we drag this all the way back in front of our part and rebuild it, there are no errors in our feature tree. So that makes it really simple and really easy to set up even though we had to go through a couple extra steps. And in order to animate this, we just go into a motion study. And inside the motion study, we're going to do an animation. The first thing we're going to do is apply a motor to this part. Now you can spin it as fast as you want if you want to make it go 1000 RPM or whatever you need to. You can go ahead and rotate that. The next thing we want to do is for our stock part, this manual part here, we actually want to physically move it. So what I'm going to do is drag a key point out to five seconds and at that five second mark in our timeline, we want to manually drag this part all the way down. So you can see that once we've moved that part, we have these green lines in our data here going all the way up to our key points. So if we calculate this, it's going to run through and as the part's moving, you can see that's actually removing that material. So it didn't take that long to set up, but there is a little bit of that trickery there that you need to do. You need to create that dummy part and hide it, and you need to use the offset surfaces to bring it into whichever part you want to remove material from. So that concludes this video. Hopefully you guys will follow us in the next video where we talk about that end mill moving through the solid stock, because that does take a little bit different process in order to get that to work. As always, if you guys have any questions, please email solidworksupport at mlc-cad.com, and we'll see you next time.